Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet. Today, we're very excited to have a guest named Dr. Paul Hochmeyer. Arden O'Connor and I, as hosts, will be just talking with him about his book called Fragile Power, Why Having Everything is Never Enough, His Lessons from Treating the Wealthy and the Famous. He has been a clinician and a consulting clinician for many organizations. He works around the world, and we want to give him a big welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for joining. So I just want to start in the beginning, Paul. How did you develop this expertise of working with the wealthy and powerful, as you called them? Well, yeah, we're going to have to go way back to the beginning. Um, you know, these uh, it's had a rather circuitous journey. I actually, like you, Diana, started my career as an attorney. And um, well, actually started my career in banking. I was an economics major in college and uh, went into banking and then went into the practice of law and was a bankruptcy lawyer and was really drawn to the incredible power of money and the, the, the ability of, uh, of money to do really amazing things and to be very destructive. Um, I was able to leave the practice of law at a very early age by a fortunate confluence of events. And I went into the world of philanthropy first doing uh, civil rights and then environmental civil rights. And in that in those positions, I again saw that in addition to money having an incredibly destructive force, that people who possessed money were objectified and manipulated, that they were robbed of their humanness and, and being seen as, as objects. And that didn't sit very well with uh, with me as, as a human being. Um, <laughs> who was interested in compassion and equality and and social justice issues. Um, September 11th happened. I was living in Europe. I was living in Amsterdam. And as a white privileged male who grew up in America, the security of my world had pretty much always been guaranteed until on that day it wasn't. And I I had an existential crisis of, of being. And I moved back to America and I started working with one of America's wealthiest families doing concierge lawyering for them. And I quickly discovered that there was a a person in that family who had a mental health issue, a profound, um, subsequently we learned that she was bipolar and was crack addict. And part of my charge was to pull her out of a crack house in Arizona. And, you know, I was really riveted by the work, I thought. You know, the, the dominant cultural message that I had learned growing up was that money is... The provides the solution to all of your problems. And if you had enough money, everything can go away. And I quickly learned that, in fact, there was aspects of the family's wealth that were actually causing this problem uh, to deepen and, and get, get and worsen over time. Um, went back to school, did a master's degree in clinical psychology, never thinking that I'd practice psychotherapy, but was riveted by the work I had to do my training, um, and I did it at a free clinic in Hollywood, so I was working with the most marginalized, disenfranchised people on the planet, HIV-positive, transgendered sex workers, and then driving across town to Holmby Hills, which is a very affluent section of of Los Angeles, and working again with this other family who lived on the other side of the economic and power bell curve, and I saw that while the externals of their lives were quite different internally, there was there was some distinct similarities, and yet the field of behavioral health, the field that I was entering into, had done a terrible job addressing um, the people who live in the world in positions of, of power, prestige, uh, and wealth. And so, decided to go back to school and did a master. I did a PhD, and I did my research on what is it like to be a person of wealth. What is it like to live in that skin on three significant levels of their being intrapersonally, which means like, what's my self-concept? How do I view myself? What's my level of motivation? Interpersonally, how does that identity impact the primary relationships in my life? And then social culturally, what does it mean to be that person walking on our planet? And and we know today, certainly it means something very uh, significant. And it's different than what it meant 10 years ago or 10 years prior. And so we need to make sure that when we do this work, we're always looking at the social cultural context of it. 
And um, yeah, so then I took that work and I went into the field specifically in a div addiction treatment and I did my clinical hours with um, of, uh, a, a treatment center in America um, and then I just continued the work. So the work has really a foundation in my personal interest, in my clinical training, and in my academic uh, research. Thank you for that. I have known you for years, Paul, and I never knew the part about how you had done some philanthropy and your earlier steps to working with this population. So that's great. Well, it all sort of seemed rather schizophrenic coming in. And, then, you know, like, like this is one of the benefits of middle age, isn't it? The, either the things that seem rather schizophrenic schizophrenic and disparate like wait a minute I'm a lawyer and I do philanthropy and now I'm a psychologist it all seemed a bit uh, disparate and then you know if you stick with it and you keep following your nose and your intuition things do come together and I believe particularly in this realm uh, this this niche that we operate in that necessity is the mother of invention uh, and, mm-hmm. and invention and so we know that our field, the field of behavioral health, has not historically done a good job in terms of delivering culturally competent and clinically excellent care to a segment of the population who needs it. Can you name a few of the ways the treatment programs and the way we treat that segment of the population is deficient? Well, the lens is typically now the the people have the, what I think the lens the lens was on a marketing focus. So we recognize particularly the field of behavioral health has become, I think, overly saturated. Um, I think there are too many players in the field. So addiction treatment in particular has been seen as uh, a way to make money. And so you have an enormous flood of capital into the market. And so the field of particularly around private pay patients. So, you know, like, again, there's, there's there's no shortage of private pay beds. In fact, there's an overabundance. There is a shortage of beds for people who need to use their insurance or who don't have any insurance. And so there was a rush in terms of how to agencies and organizations were looking at, well, how do we market to this population and how do we get them in our facilities without looking at what the distinct cultural markers of this particular population are. And that's what I have done in my work. If we know that we're dealing with a minority segment of the population, and we are, right, top 10%, top 1%, what have you, then we know other minority populations have distinct clinical mark, clinic, cultural markers. And so we need to consider what those cultural markers are in our clinical formulations. And historically, that hasn't happened. And clinicians have not been able to create frames that hold the enormous power that comes from wealth. Now, whether the person of wealth wants that power or not, sometimes they don't want that power. Sometimes they deny that they have it. Um, But there's extraordinary power in wealth, and we need to acknowledge it. And we need to address it on the full, on the full expression of it. So we know that wealth can do incredibly beneficial things. Wealth can be incredibly destructive as well. And so the field of behavioral health, to answer your question directly, has not addressed the three distinct cultural markers of this population and created clinically effective formulations to treat them. Got it. So can we back this up a little less globally, a little less socially, I would love to hear just one of your experiences in an in, in actual, you know, sort of informative experience for you where you were working with a segment of this population, they had a breakthrough, and that maybe was a breakthrough for you as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's been, um, there are so many, aren't there? I mean, I think that, 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 you know, the nature of the work, if we didn't, if I didn't have a breakthrough in the work, I would, you know, we wouldn't mm-hmm. keep doing, the work is exhausting, isn't it? I mean, you, you're you in the yes. trenches and you, you do this, um, and, and particularly active addictions are grueling and uh, some, some and, and so there's a profound amount of destruction. So if we didn't see repair, if we didn't see change and growth, then, then we couldn't continue to do the work. I think for me, you know, certainly, my entree into this work of seeing that of going behind the, wiz, the, the, the the curtain of Oz and seeing 
that the veneer of success and power and wealth is not the panacea that cures all ills was was really a, an opening, uh, an eye-opening moment for me. And, you know, we're taught, particularly in America, we live in a very aspirational society and culture. And look, we're human beings, and human beings are hunter-gatherers. And so we're genetically wired to go out and acquire nuts and compare how many nuts we have to our neighbors. And so we live in an aspirational world, and I never want people to think that my work means that I want to diminish the importance of aspiration. Aspiration is critically important. Um, we, but aspiration need, needs to be fully balanced. And, and so I think having clients in particular, you know, I work with a lot of middle-aged narcissistic men. Um, <laughs> I should probably go into my own analysis and figure out why, that, why I... Can you describe... Population. <laughs> Can you describe when you say that, give us a few bullet points of what that would look like so we can identify. So you have a first generation wealth earner who has spent his or her life acquiring wealth and working very myopically towards a quantitative goal. Um, what that looks like was early in their developmental path, someone whose care and protection they needed betrayed them. And that they sustain what's called a severe ego injury. And so their psyche was deeply, deeply wounded. And the message, because they're very smart and very clever and very adaptive, is that people are unsafe. What is safe is wealth and money and material possessions. And if I have enough money, whatever it is, 100 million, a billion, 10 million, whatever the number is, everybody seems to have a number of what they think security will provide them, then then I will be safe and protected in the world. And so what they did with the best of intentions, and actually quite adaptive, uh, is to go out and begin to manifest success, material and quantitative success in their world. What happened is they wake up sort of in their late 40s, early 50s, mid 50s, late 50s, through some existential crisis. Uh, their child dies of an overdose. Uh, they Their child gets kicked out of a prep school. Um, their wife files for divorce. Their husband files for divorce. They find out their spouse is having an affair. Um, there's some profound wake-up call that happens, and they gas. They think, whoa, wait a minute. Like, I have set myself up from, from to be protected from all of this. And now I've been brought to my knees and I don't know how to deal with this. I don't, I don't know how to handle this. And they come into therapy, sometimes willing, most, most of the cases not willing. They come from what's called external motivation, where some, they're, if, if their spouse says, look, either you get help or X, Y, or Z is happening. And so they come into treatment and they don't trust human beings. And the whole nature of the psychotherapeutic relationship, and this is something I discuss at length in my book, is, is, is how the whole field of behavioral health and psychotherapy is set up to run counter to the three cultural markers of this population, which are isolation, but through my research, I found that people of wealth and power are are, are, are isolated at higher degrees than, than people of, of middle class and lower socioeconomic groups, because quite frankly, they really don't need other people. Um, there's this notion of suspiciousness of outsiders, which is not unique to this population. Every minority group, every tri well, human beings are tribal, and so we organize ourselves around common interests and against common foes, and a construct of, of what's called hyper- Agency, which is the power to control your world to avoid any discomfort. Now, Diana, you, you, you've put a lot of people under treatment and you work as a clinician. These cultural markers run against everything that we expect these patients to do in treatment, right? Come out right. of your isolation. Trust me, I'm going to be an outsider and tolerate discomfort while I, while I poke around the very things that you have been repressing and denying for, your, for probably maybe the entirety of your existence. So the very nature of the, of the work that we're asking patients to do both in individual psychotherapy and in residential treatment in particular runs against every single one of those cultural markers. So then 
sitting with a patient and tolerating. And this patient, this population, it, you know, they challenge. They're very challenged. Um, they're what's described in the literature as difficult patients. Um, who are you? What can you tell me? Uh, terrified of vulnerability, terrified of showing. Because basically, they've gotten where they are in the world financially because they didn't allow any vulnerability, right? Vulnerability is certainly... Right. They, they, they operate in such extraordinary competitive segments of the population. So, so I think that's, you know, that's, that's hopefully that'll, that's, that's an answer to your question as to the insights. And then sitting while, while we both navigate the, 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 the challenges of the therapy, establishing what's called the therapeutic alliance, which is the connection that the clinician has with the patient um, and seeing that happen uh, in the therapeutic alliance. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't happen. Sure. So you've worked in some of the um, programs throughout our country. Have you had to deal or counsel, mentor other clinicians who really struggle with counter-transference for this population and what that means? That's very much a part of what I do um, in terms with with the treatment centers that I work with and the mental health clinics around the world. Um, this particular population is highly seductive uh, in terms of they represent everything that most Americans have been taught they need to aspire to. And so working, uh, and so they're going to have very distinct reactions to that particular population. So if a noted celebrity comes in, right, they're going to have all sorts of reactions to that celebrity, both on the conscious and the unconscious level. That's what's called counter-transference. So there are two, there are two distinct um, dynamics that occur in a therapeutic relationship. The first is called transference, and the second is called counter-transference. Now, these have their origins in psychodynamic theory. Think about Freud, think about Carl, uh, think about Jung, um, and more specifically in what's called object relations. And so, what happens is when, when you get two people, when you meet somebody, right, uh, we 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 think our brains think reductively, and so we we tend we need to put people we we put people in boxes basically, and we establish our connection to them, our relationship with them, based upon prior relationships that we have. Now, the most powerful of those are the relationships that we had with our family. So, typically, um, let's say I'm working. And I do with with a millennial, with a generation, a, a zier. I think that's that's. I get confused with the, with the alphabet now. I think we're down <laughs> to generation Z. Uh, so so they come into me, and so the the transference that they will have to me is, my, even though I hate to admit it, I'm getting old. Is that you know, I'm their father, right? So I, I I or I could be their mother, or I could be an uncle, or I could be some person in their family of origin. That's the the conscious and the unconscious reaction that they're going to have towards me, right? Because they have to put me, because of their reductive brain, they have to put me in a box. The reaction that I'm going to have is called counter-transference. So this notion of the therapist uh, being a, a blank slate is is really it's it's not it's it's very an antiqu it's an antiquated concept right so so I'm going to have a reaction to that patient I'm going to have judgments that patient is going to bring up something in me if it's a 22 year old failure to launch young man or young woman I'm going to, they're going to invoke some very strong paternal instincts in me and so I need to be paying attention to that. I need to be working in that dynamic because what I need to do is recognize the object that they have internalized from their family of origin. If that's what's called a negative object. So if they have a father who's very critical and who never supported them and they never felt properly seen and heard, I then need to be a positive father objective figure and, and create a reparative experience relationally with that patient. And so there's going to be all sorts of things going on, both consciously and unconsciously. And that's where particularly 
if we're working in personality disorders, dependent personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorders, uh, borderline personality disorders, the work, the reparative work, occurs in the transference, in the tra- uh, counter-transference, and, and in the internalizing of, of a positive uh, father object or mother object or, or, or whatever we need to, whatever object we need to repair. Got it. So the relationship itself is of therapeutic value. Arden, I'm so sorry. I keep hogging this because I've had these questions for Paul for a number of years, um, but I don't want to keep you out of this conversation. No, I think it's been fascinating. I guess one area that I think of is for those listeners that are on the other end of the line and they're not clinically trained such as yourself and they're working with either the profile that you've described of the narcissistic male client um, or somebody who comes from extreme wealth and is exhibiting some challenges in the behavioral health arena. If I'm a lawyer, uh, an estate planner, uh, some type of medical professional, you know, what how do you think about how to intervene, how to maybe have a tough conversation with somebody with that profile in a way that they can actually hear it and that you don't necessarily offend them or risk getting fired, which we know is a major concern for many professionals? Right. That it's, it's, it is the most relevant question concerning advisors into this space. Um, so basically what you want to think about, you want to think about having a basic understanding of the issues. So you want to have a basic understanding of what is narcissism. You know, we tend to throw these words around. They they they, they get in, they enter into our common lexicon and they're thrown around with abandon. So he's so narcissistic. Oh, she's so codependent. Um, he's an addict. So, so get a basic understanding of what those concepts are and just a simple Google, right? Figure out what those are. Also understand that you, basically you do not need to develop an expertise in it. You need to have someone in your ecosystem who you trust, uh, who, if the if you need to refer out to that that you can have, you know, Deloitte has done some really interesting research in, into this space. Um, their Swiss office uh, came out with a report, and and I can certainly send it over to you that you could send to the listeners in terms of what's really needed, because the data shows, particularly on the wealth management space, uh, that the profitability is decreased, I think, by forty percent, and yet assets have increased by sixty percent, and so. How do you create stickiness with the patient, po- with the patients, with the client population? And so it is providing full service. And 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 now with the advent of AI and and with the advent of quant funds, um, that capitalizing on returns, capitalizing on market inefficiencies, uh, isn't really providing a point of stickiness. The data also shows that there's an enormous amount of trust that the that your clients trust you probably they're, they're trusting you with their you know with their lives and with their well-beings and so the relationship that you have is extraordinary and so certainly honoring that um, delicately being very delicate being very gentle recognizing your limitations and that recognizing that this is not in your wheelhouse and having um, do your due diligence, you know, just like if you're if you're a wealth manager, just like you would do your due diligence on on a fund that you're investing your clients into. Have a you know have a Rolodex of three clinicians and three treatment centers that you have gone and kicked the tires and have met with, and 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 you really trust them because look, transferring a client over to, to look, I, I am. I am a pretty, I'll go so far as to say neurotic in terms of transfer. You know, when I make a referral um, of my patient to another professional, uh, you know, that that relationship is, is there's such, maintaining the integrity of that relationship and maintaining that trust is critical. So recognizing that uh, particularly if you are, saying to the world on your websites um, that you're full service, that you provide full service to a family, um, that, that you're doing it and that you're, that, that you're not afraid of, of, of delving into these issues, but you recognize your limitations. Um, and then again, if you're making a referral, certainly make a referral to at least three professionals who you 
have have vetted. Uh, so that's 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 the advice um, that I would give, that I give, that I've been given for the last decade and a half, actually. It makes all the sense in the world. I have one last question, which is just, you know, if you think back on your career trajectory, is there ever a time where you looked at a specific scenario and said, gosh, in hindsight, I wish I had handled this differently? Well, I think all the time. I mean, you know, I, I think there was always something that we can do better. There's always something that we can do different. You know, my patients stick with me. You know, they, they're they in my head, and I, and I think about them all the time. You know, even the patients that I've had 20 years ago in the beginning of my career, you know, even when I was at the a uh, free clinic in Hollywood. I, uh, there's still pa- it's still patients that I come back and I think, gosh, I wonder, you know, what he or she's doing. And boy, did I get to them or did I plant a seed? And you know, often in this work, uh, we never really know. Like the best that we can hope for is that we're going to plant a seed and then something sticks. And you know, I've had situations where patients who I've treated 10 years prior have rung me up or sent me an email with a picture of their new baby and saying, you know, uh, when I met, you said X, Y, or Z, and I couldn't really hear it at the time, but um, but it's it it changed me, and I did this, and I did that, and now I'm I'm doing this, and thank you, thank you, thank you, and and, and yeah, I mean, I I. I'm a seeker, you know, I, I think that there's always something that we can constantly be doing better. So probably with every patient that I've ever had, I'm, I think there's never been a complete home run, you know, it's a series of singles and doubles. Um, and, and so creating, moving them in a reparative direction. I like that great analogy. Philosophy. So we often close our show with what is something you would like our listeners to consider, Paul? Just one thing. Um, well, the, the challenge is going to be being able to, for me to articulate it in a simple session. In a simple session, but I really want, particularly in this this period of division that we're living in, um, I really want people to experience or to consider the lived experience of somebody who you don't understand. That's great. It is great. Thank you very much. Thank sure, you so much for being on our podcast today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Always a pleasure to to talk with you ladies and keep up the great work. Thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet. We were thrilled to have Dr. Hochmeyer today and hope you'll listen to our next episode. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet, a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.